Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, July 24th, and this is weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear on this podcast or hear or see on this video is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a financial advisor. I do not know your personal situation. Therefore, I cannot advise you by law. Please do your own due diligence. It's your life. It's your money. It's your responsibility. So when I, I originally did this video yesterday and I re-listened to it and I didn't like the tone that I had in the video. So I decided to redo it. You know, we're ta- I've been talking a lot about what's going on, not just in financial markets, but in society as a whole. And I have my views and my opinions based on what I'm seeing and based on my philosophical anchor that I have that I've developed over the course of my life. It can be in sharp contrast to yours. You may not agree. You may have a different opposing view on things, and that's fine. But I'm going to continue to put out what I think is my view, what I think is happening, and what the repercussions are. A lot of these things that I talk about, what's happened over the last 18 months in this country with the disease that can't be mentioned, is not because I'm a conspiracy theorist or I'm just an obstinate person. I have a view that people of wealth and power try to get more wealth and power. I believe that there's a certain cast of people that are gravitate towards power. They have sociopathic tendencies. They want to control other people. They want more power. It's just something that they desire. Most people are not like this. Most people want to be left alone. Most people want to do their own thing. Most people want to just live their life without being having a a jack boot on their on their throat or being told what to do. You basically do what you do, I do what I do, and as long as you don't harass me, put your hands on me or steal my my property, we can pretty much get along. That's most people that I've run into. So when we saw, you know, we we had this this push which we've seen before, you know, I mean, we've seen people wanting to have central control of things, people that are in leadership positions, if you want to call it that, or people that are in power. This leads to more control, it leads to more wealth. Um, some people are greedy, some people desire power, some people are evil. There is evil in the world. There are people that are just evil people. There are people that will lie to you, there will people that will deceive you, there are people that will hurt you, there are people that will steal from you, and they're not just people, muggers on the street, people in power. So, when I see these things, I feel obligated to say something. I feel obligated to at least bring it to your attention because alternative media is the only thing that's actually seeking the truth. That's ultimately what I want to seek is the truth. And as Thomas Jefferson said, I would rather bring the truth out and have the heavens be brought down in, on account of it. You know, a lot of people want to say, well, we shouldn't look at certain things. It's too, it's too complicated or the repercussions of exposing something are too, uh, the people can't take it. Like I said, I would have the truth come out and have the heavens be brought down on account of it. That's how important it is. You know, there's a meme, there's a a metaphor about the, how to boil a frog. Now, I don't endorse trying to do this as an experiment. I don't know how it came about, but the idea is basically that if you throw a live frog into a pot of boiling water, the frog will immediately jump out because the scalding hot water, it will react to that. Conversely, the, the other part of the metaphor is that if you place a frog into a room temperature pan of water and turn the heat up, the frog does not jump out. It doesn't the, the, the change in temperature is so discreet and, and so slow over time, the frog doesn't know that it's being boiled. And so this is what we see in politics. This is what we see in these governments that 
you know, the, the whole desire of these bureaucracies and these governments is to gain more power. It's just the nature of the beast. And so, you know, if we go back to the old analogy or not analogy, but the statement that was made, you know, after the financial crisis, you know, don't let a crisis go to waste. And so these, in my view, some of these crises, some real, some manufactured, are used by people that don't, for nefarious reasons, to get more power or more wealth at your expense. And so things are done incrementally to you to see if you'll comply, to see if you'll jump out of the pan. And that's what kind of applies to this week's reality check. France has rolled out a new COVID-19 health pass obligatory for anyone visiting any cultural or leisure facilities with a capacity of more than 50 people. From Wednesday, anyone visiting cinemas, museums, sports matches, and other cultural venues are required to show proof of vaccination against COVID-19, basically a vaccine pass, a negative test, or a recent recovery from the virus. Uh, simultaneously, or in concurrence with this, in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson confirmed COVID vaccine certificates will be required from the end of September to attend nightclubs and any large venues in England. We reserve the right to mandate certification at any point if it is necessary to reduce transmission, he said on Monday. And I should serve notice now that by the end of September, when all over 18s will have had the chance to be double jabbed, we are planning to make full vaccination the condition of entry to nightclubs and other venues where large crowds gather. And so this is how you boil the frog. Um, they're attaching, you know, most people, uh, a lot of people don't follow the same lifestyle I do. I don't go to clubs, bars, and things like that. Uh, a lot of people like to do this. That's their deal. Um, and so they're starting off with things that people want to do. Eventually, once they get you attuned to that, it will then be grocery stores, workplaces, things like that. And I challenge people, you know, to look back in history. You know, a lot of people are going to say to me, well, you're just being paranoid. You're being conspiracy. Am I? I mean, I said oh, a year ago that this is where we were going to end up. And now it's coming to fruition. Once they get the people to go along with this, you know, they have made you wear masks that don't do anything. I've talked about this before. I was in the military for 15 years. I was in the U.S. Navy. We trained extensively on chemical, biological, and radiological attacks. Um, we would have drills. We would have certain protective gear that we would wear. The protective gear has to be worn exactly as instructed for it to be effective. The same thing is in the medical profession or when you go get fit tested for a respirator if you're working in an industrial setting, they don't just hand you a random respirator or a random mask and tell you to go into some process and be protected. You have to go for certain processes and certain respirators. You have to be fit tested. You have to go for a physical. You have to be, the mask has to be fitted to your face specifically to create a seal to keep out the contaminant that could harm you. They don't just hand you random things. So, you know, this idea that you were going to protect everyone with a cloth mask over their face that they're constantly touching, they're not trained to wear properly, it's not fit tested. I mean, even, even a K95 mask has to be fit tested. Medical people in hospitals that wear some of these masks, they actually have fit testing too. They put a thing over their head and they inject a little um, flavoring into the area and make sure that the mask is sealing properly. That way you don't have, you know, you're cutting down the chance of the contaminants. And so it's just not scientific, but they got you to do it. So then they just ratchet it up again. They turn the temperature up again, and then you accept it. And they turn the temperature up again, and you accept it. And they turn the temperature up because it's incremental and you don't feel the heat rising. You don't put two and two together. And most people are compliant. You know, the, the state has a monopoly on force and violence. Most people will respond to authority figures if they're told to do something. Most people don't want to rebel because what's the big deal? Just put a mask on so nobody looks at you askew in the store or nobody yells at you. That's how they get it, get you to comply. And then when you comply with that, then they'll up the ante. And then you'll comply with that. And pretty soon 
you don't have any freedom. You don't have any type. You're doing exactly what the state tells you to do. And this is where we're heading here. I mean, is this ever going to end? All pandemics in history have ended eventually. They've burnt out on their own, <clears throat> even in ancient times, even in medieval times. They didn't have vaccines. They didn't have any kind of medical. Eventually, the things dissipated. But this is never going to end now. I mean, we're going to have, this is going to become endemic in the rotating group of viruses, of upper respiratory viruses that come about every year. That's just what's going to happen along with influenza, rhinoviruses, coronaviruses. This is going to, so we're just going to continue this forever and it never ends. Does anybody find it interesting that both these countries announce this at the same time? With basically the same policy? Would you suggest that maybe it was coordinated or there's some discussion about it? Or they just randomly came up with the same policy at the same time and rolled it out at the same time? People of power and wealth conspire. So in Australia, Victoria's chief state of Victoria, chief health officer says vaccine passports are being considered nationally once the jab has been made available to all eligible Australians. Does anybody find it interesting why they're so adamant about everybody getting this jab, getting this serum? I don't call it a vaccine because it's not really a vaccine. It's a MR, mRNA gene therapy designed to create spike proteins so that your immune system will react to that when the actual virus if you come in contact with the virus that has those spike proteins. What we're beginning to find out, I think, is that these spike proteins are, are causing issues with people's bodies and causing them to react in ways that weren't anticipated. But let's keep going with uh, the Victoria Health Officer, Chief Health Officer. It needs to be validated, verifiable, not forgeable, and we need to understand exactly what kind of allowances could happen with a fully vaccinated or partially, partially vaccinated person. You know, here in, here in the United States, we've had the Alabama governor come out, which I believe this is basically probably going to seal her not getting reelected, but assuming we have free elections going forward, Alabama governor says about the unvaccinated, quote, time to start blaming the unvaccinated folks, unquote, for rising cases of COVID in the state. Yep. See, the, the, the minority of people that didn't get this vaccination or this so-called gene therapy are to blame now when we're already seeing breakthrough cases in the UK and Israel of vaccinated people. Those are the facts. So now we're going to blame the unvaccinated because vaccinated people are getting, getting, um, this is another thing that we predicted would happen. She goes on to say, let's be crystal clear about this issue. The new cases of COVID are because of unvaccinated folks. That's just a lie and it's retarded. That's not true. You can go look the facts up yourself. She's lying. This is what they do. They lie. And people just accept the lies. They don't. The information is available. You can go look it up yourself. Most people won't look it up. And that's what's really scary. It's not like the Soviet Union or East Germany where you couldn't even disseminate information. Where every typewriter was registered with the Stasi and they could tell there was no mimeograph machines weren't available. I mean, it was almost impossible to disseminate information. All the information is available if you want to find it. and People still don't want to look at it. So what I'm telling you is, is that this, along with this climate change hysteria, is being used by these people in power to try to get more power. And why do I think they're doing this? I've said it before, and I'll say it again really quickly. I believe that the debts in the Western countries or in the world are so large now, they can never be repaid back. People in power understand that. The Social Security and Medicare and all these pension benefits in all these countries, they can't be paid. They know this, okay? You have an expectation that they will be paid. When that becomes not knowledgeable when everybody realizes because reality is reality and it will slap you in the head whether you want to it want it to or not at some point reality if you smoke for 40 years uh, and you just you know think that today i didn't get cancer or i feel okay and then you get cancer after 40 years 
the reality has hit you that your lifetime of smoking probably caused your lung cancer. The same thing's going to happen here. And when it sets in, no cognitive dissonance or anything, it's there now, okay? And so they know this. They know that it can't be paid. They know these things won't be paid. And they know what the repercussions of that will be politically, socially, and economically. And so what better way to deal with this issue and stay in power than to have all these crises and create all this government power so that they can suppress, so that they can, you know, well, we can't, everything can be blamed on these, on climate change and, and, and COVID, an upper respiratory virus, similar to the cold. Because they've trained you, they will have trained you over five or 10 years to accept it. And you're accepting it. That's what I think is really happening. And then they will maintain their power. They will maintain their wealth. You will be in poverty. And then you'll be sitting there wondering what happened. What other explanation is there? They're do- is, the, is the other explanation that they're just angels and they're doing all this for our benefit because they care about us? I'd like to know in the comments, are there people that actually believe that, that these government bureaucrats and officials are there for your benefit and that they really care about you and that they're really, really doing these things because they really care and want to make sure that you're okay? I, I'm sure there are people that believe that. But, you know, I don't, I don't think that that's the majority of people. I hope not. So this is interesting. I'm showing you a chart. I'm not going to tell you what this chart is. I will tell you in the next slide. But I want you to take a look at it. People on the listening on the podcast can't see it. But what we have is on the horizontal, we have going back to 1990 all the way to 2021. So 31 years of data being collected here. And there are data points on this chart. And on the vertical, it's denominated in segments of 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000, 12,000. And the data points on the bottom are all basically almost flatlined. They're not at zero. They're barely almost on zero, though. 1990, it's, you know, very just above zero. 2000 just above you can just barely see a little gap 2010 same thing 2018 it's rising a little bit so you'd have nothing above even 500 much less 2000 or 12000 and then in 2020 and going into 21 the, the chart jumps to over 11000 going on 12000 so you have 20 or 30 years of basically flatline and then this massive jump, not even, I can't, what's above massive? Gigantic, humongous, exponential jump from basically less than 500 to 12,000. If you saw a data set for something like this, like a stock, you'd be like, wow, this is crazy. I mean, it even puts a Tesla chart to, to shame. What is this chart measuring? And if it, the data is accurate, man, I would really want to know what happened here. So what is this chart measuring? So this is the chart measuring all the deaths reported to the VAERS system by year. What is the VAERS system? This is the CDC data base that measures vaccine adverse reactions. Okay. So if you look into the insert into the Pfizer or Moderna um, insert that comes along with the vaccine, which you probably haven't seen, but it's available on the internet or for any vaccine for that matter, the federal government requires that if there's adverse reactions to the vaccines, any vaccine, a measles vaccine, you know, mumps, rubella, whatever, diphtheria, all these different vaccines that people take, if there's adverse reactions to them, it's required that they be reported so that the CDC can track this stuff. And so what we've seen, this has been going on since 1990, the database, it's all available on the CDC. I'll put the link to a site that visualizes it, but it all tracks back to the CDC. It's all out there. They're not hiding this data. 
again, they're not hiding this data. I didn't make this data up or get it from, you know, a right wing, you know, obscure white right wing site. This is from the actual federal government's database that's available and is updated weekly, by the way. It's not something that just comes out once a year. Every week, this is updated. And so what we've seen since 1990 is basically anywhere from, you know, 175 to 300 deaths based or attributable to vaccines, all vaccines. Okay, so the 70 odd vaccines that we have or whatever there are, I think there's around 70 something vaccines in a population of 330 million, approximately anywhere from two to 300 people die of vaccines every year. That's just how it is. I mean, we've, we've said that, you know, we're willing to accept the benefits of these vaccines and accept the fact that two or 300 people will have adverse reactions and die because of it. That's a good cost benefit analysis. As I said before, and I've said all along during this whole crisis, that this is all about risk reward and cost benefit. And so we introduced a new couple of new vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer this year, ostensibly for COVID. Something that most people will have no issue with if they contract it. Depending on your age and your physical disposition, your chances of surviving an encounter with the COVID virus as an unvaccinated person are 99% plus. Obviously, as you get older, you're, you're, it goes down. And those facts are available. That's on the CDC website too. You can see that data. It's updated. They're not hiding it also. So what's happening here? So in the last year, we've had almost 11,000 people die from the COVID vaccine. And no one, is this on the news? Is anybody talking about this? Is this in the New York Times? Is there an investigation? Are they going to convene? Is the federal government going to convene a panel or a body to discuss this or check into it. Most of the people that are dying of this vaccine reactions are younger people. We know about the heart issues, the stroke issues, blood clotting. This is what the adverse reactions are. You can see what the adverse reactions are because the data is available. It's parsed. They tell you. Is this not worth making an inquiry about? Is this not worth being curious about? We rush these things to market with very little ex er experimentation or data, and this is what we're seeing. Now, this is just the deaths. If you want to talk about the adverse reactions, it's over a half million, or close to a half million. It's like 400 and some odd thousand, you know, people that have bad reactions but don't die. Is that not worth talking about? Or What are the long-term consequences of taking this thing? We don't know yet because... We don't have the data. We're gathering data now. That's what they're doing. And so I think that they're, you know, they have immunity right now. For, and this is under experimental use authorization. So everybody that's taking this thing is the, is the group that's being experimented on. You know, they've introduced vaccines before. Uh, you can go back in history. During, I think, the Ford administration, there was a swine flu outbreak or H1N1 outbreak. They rushed a vaccine to market, and I think 25 odd people died from it, and they pulled it from the market. 25 people died, and they pulled it from the market. Civilization didn't end be because H1N1 went through the population. So what's going on? I ask you again, what's really going on? This is the data. You're not being told. It's out there in your face. You can go find it, and no one's asking why. And then I have people come on here and then challenge me and say, I need to go to a COVID ward to see what's really going on. I don't need to go to a COVID ward. The data is all available. I know how many people died as a percentage of each age cohort. Again, if you get COVID, you have over, depending on your age and comorbidities, you have anywhere from a 98 to 99.9% .9 chance of nothing happening to you except having a bad cold. But yet this is happening and no one's talking about it. Why is uh, every politician pushing for everyone to get this and no one's making any inquiries? What's going to happen six months from now with these people? What's going to happen a year, three years, five years down the road? You know, there was a kind of a Schadenfreude type situation. I didn't put it on here. I was going to. I didn't want to dance on this person's grave. There was a 33-year-old guy. 
Um, and he put out a tweet about, you know, people not being vaccinated. And he said all the things that he wished would happen, that you would get flat tires, that your soda would be flat, all these little cute little things. And, uh, you know, he's 33 years old. And about four months after he made that little cute, you know, statement against people that were not vaccinated, um, he was admitted to the hospital with heart problems, had two open heart surgeries, and he's dead now. He had no previous health issues. Maybe he just had an undiagnosed heart problem. That's possible. Or maybe it was attributable to this because we're seeing a lot of younger people reporting out things that they should not be happening to them with their cardiovascular system when they're that young. All I'm saying is this is the data. All I'm saying is look at it with an unbiased opinion. When you see something like this, doesn't it shock you? Or do you just say, well, some people say that's an acceptable risk. I don't think this thing going vertical, when is it, when does this stop going vertical? When does the CDC stop reporting this data? Because it becomes too embarrassing or too, too many people start asking questions. How come the news media is not asking this? Everybody's on board with this thing and we're going to get, make everybody take it. And we're going to keep ratcheting it down until you take it. And no one's, you know, we're seeing riot, not rioting, but we're seeing protests all over Europe today and in Australia, and it's not being reported. It's not 10 or 15 people nuts out in front of the parliament. It's tens and hundreds of thousands of people protesting against this stuff, against vaccine passports, wanting their freedom back, wanting their lives back, wanting government to get back in their, out of their life. And it's not being reported. So I do think that this is actionable. I do think this has repercussions. I do think this matters for financial markets and for your wealth and your health, which is more important. And like I've said before, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical professional, but that doesn't mean I can't do pattern recognition and look at data sets and see a, an anomaly like this and then have a question mark go off in my head about what is really going on. And if you're not that curious, about something like this, you certainly are not going to be curious enough to be successful in the financial markets. So that's about all I have to say about that. Be curious what other folks think in the comments. I know it's a touchy subject. I know people are very, have very, very impassioned views one way or another, but this is very serious in my mind. And I think that we're being pushed into a dystopian, communistic, one world government ruling, or at least central control of every facet of our life. And I'm not really happy about it. And I don't think once we're in it, once we're in it, it will be very difficult to get out of it. The time to stand up is now. Most people are not like that. I get that. But you, you that are, you that have a forum, you that have a venue, you know, this is how, you know, thousand, one termite can't bring a house down, but thousands can. So, let me take a drink of coffee re real quick. Excuse me. It's early in the morning. So Democrats seek to tackle climate change with import tax. Again, the other tool that these people are using to control things. And it's also, I mean, it's not just, don't get me wrong. I don't think this is like one big, you know, conspiracy that about a bunch of people sit in a star chamber and figure out it's a lot of different constituencies, right? There's grifters that want to make money off green energy. There's people that actually believe that the climate's being destroyed by CO2. There's po politicians that stick their finger up and realize if they say the right thing at the right time, they can get elected and get power. There's all these different things, but it all seems to flow in the same direction, right? So what's going on here? Democrats are eyeing a tax on imports from countries that don't have strong policies aimed at combating climate change, seeking to include such a tax in a wide ranging spending package that could pass without Republican votes. So basically, if you go down to the next blur, they're talking about polluter import fees. So this is really ironic in my mind. You know, we basically had a policy or, or, or way of doing things here in the U.S. where we offshored all of our man, dirty manufacturing. We lowered our labor costs. You know, that's your Republican Party there with their uh, taking money from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is a lobbying group and for corporations, big corporations, to, you know, offshore 
their industries to China and Thailand and Vietnam, where they don't have the same environmental standards that we have, because why would they? They're trying to rapidly industrialize. You know, when countries become wealthier, they typically get more environmentally sensitive. When you're poor and, and your population is struggling to survive, you're not so much worried about CO2 emissions as you are making sure that people's standard of living gets to a certain level and that they can live a, a life, okay? People forget that. We didn't have environmentalism in the UK during the Industrial Revolution or in the US when we were industrializing. That only comes about after you become relatively wealthy. And so what the Democrats are talking about doing, because they're this is what one of their planks is, this is what they stand for. Now they're going to tell other countries that they're going to slap taxes on their goods when they come into the country because they're not meeting the goals that the people in the power in the US or in Europe feel that they should meet. Does anyone think that this will be deflationary over time? Does anyone think this will lead to good relations with other countries? You know, we're in a, I don't agree with it, but it's a fact. We're, we were the big guy, kid on the block for many years after World War II, and basically a little bit prior to that. We were insulated from both world wars. So from our two moats, uh, the, U the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and so we didn't experience the death, destruction, and deprivation that a lot of other countries went through after these wars. And so I think our perspective is a little bit skewed. And then we, we were the last industrial power left unscathed. So that gave us a huge advantage, which we've subsequently squandered. And now we were the hegemon. We were the big kid on the block. We were telling everybody else what to do. And we, you know, we thought we were the good guys. That's all debatable. It's with outside the scope of this discussion. But now we have rising powers around the world. That's another discussion, whether you think China is rising. But typically, we've had powers that rise and fall over time through history. That goes without saying. And when this happens, there's usually conflict when these changes happen. And so, you know, this is, I think, meets several goals for the people in power. You know, they realize that China's on the rise, wants to expand itself, wants to be a bigger global player. And this also meets the needs of the climate change, green energy, whatever they're trying to do up there. And so here's what this guy, Danny Richter, said from the Citizens Climate Lobby. I mean, this is, you know, there's all kinds of lobbyists up there for all kinds of things. Here's what he says. I think it's great that this is being discussed. I think it could be very effective, especially considering that the EU and the United States are the number one and number two largest economies in the world. That's true. And so we're going to use our economic might to force other countries to do what we want them to do. Now, you may think that that's a good idea because you believe that the earth is in danger of spiraling out of control in this climate change situation. But what I would suggest to you is history shows that the countries that have this imposed on them don't feel the same way. These can be considered in some countries as acts of war, as belligerents. That's certainly not going to be good for going forward for relations and for, you know, a globalist mentality that was going to be, you know, lead us to the new promised land of one world, right? So it's something to watch. It's something we predicted would happen. Now, I don't think it's going to get passed right off the bat. This would be a little bit difficult right now for the Democrats to do, but this is where they're moving. This is where the people in Western Europe are moving. The government's there also. So with all the money printing we've had, with all of the no one can fail attitudes we've had since, you know, the great financial crisis in 2008, what we saw this year was the fewest U.S. business bankruptcies for the first six months in at least 16 years. And so this view that I think has come about after these serial bubbles we've had over the last 20 years, the tech wreck in 2000, the housing bubble in 2008, is that we don't let anybody fail. We'll come in and we'll, the government and the Federal Reserve will bail people out. Um, and so what we've created is this moral hazard, this idea that you can take on all this risk and that there's a, the Fed and the, and the federal government will be there to bail, bail you out. And this is what's called moral hazard. And I think that that will work until it doesn't work anymore. And I think it's dangerous to predicate your 
business and investment mindset around the fact that you're going to take excessive risk because at some point, if it goes, starts to go wrong, the Fed will bail you out or the federal government will bail you out. That's not how historically vibrant, successful economies are run. It will work until it doesn't work. The problem is, is the crises continue to get bigger and the bailouts continue to get bigger. The balance sheet at the Fed continues to get bigger. The federal government's debt continues to get bigger. At some point, it will matter. And that's really how it is. I mean, I struggle with that for many years. It's like, how can I just keep doing this? How big can the Fed's balance sheet get? I mean, Felix Zuloff, oh, excuse me, let me take another drink of coffee. Felix Zuloff, who is a Swiss analyst that I follow, very smart guy, he was interviewed. He used to be on the Barron's Roundtable. He's not just some, some character, you know, on the internet, fringe character. He's a pretty serious guy. And he thinks the Fed's balance sheet will end up at 40 or $50 trillion of it, you know, by the end of the decade. I think that that's possible. I think that, you know, this will continue, you know, things will continue like this until it finally doesn't and it breaks. So maybe you get another reflation. Maybe we go through another big break in the economy. I mean, right now the bubbles are so large. The debts are so large, so much malinvestment, so much, uh, skewed economic activity that, you know, when this thing breaks, so many people are going to be hurt. So of course there's going to be calls for the government to do something. But at some point, you can only print so much money. You can only incur so much debt. It's just not a viable long-term strategy for an economy. And so I just wanted to point this out because it's one of my themes. I think of another reason why I'm an advocate for hard assets is because all roads lead to inflation in my book and in my analysis. And the timing, of course, is always the factor. And you're going to have volatility on the way to that higher inflation with periods of disinflation and deflation based on what happens in the economy. But this is just another brick in the wall of the, what I think is uh, a skewed BS economy. So this is interesting. You know, we're seeing oil prices go up. Uh, I've talked about this off and on. I think our call on oil and energy has been tremendous. Uh, when everybody was running for the exits, uh, we were already standing outside. We knew what was going to happen. And uh, we were buying things when they were ultra cheap. The fact of the matter is every facet of your life has energy involved in it. Energy allows for your life. And so we knew that once the fear dissipated, that things were going to turn around. And another man, another characteristic of that fear has been the lack of investment in new resources in this extractive industry, which is the oil and gas industry. And so um, I think these are some comments by the Saudi oil minister, but I think that they have overriding context about what's going on. So this is from the article. And I'm, I apologize when I dump the other video I made, I got rid of all the links. I won't be able to put all the links back to this this week. I apologize for that. Uh, I try to put the links up for you guys because I don't want you to just think I'm just pulling this out of my backside. I like you to go read the articles yourself if you're interested and you can make your own conclusions so that I'm not taking things out of context or skewing things. So drill baby drill is gone forever. That was the recent assessment of Saudi Prince Salman of the American oil industry's future potential. As Saudi Arabia's energy minister, the prince is one of the most influential voices in the global oil markets. Fortune termed it a, quote, bold taunt, unquote, and a warning to U.S. frackers to not increase oil production. As reported this month by the Wall Street Journal, quote, capital markets showed little interest in funding expansive new drilling campaigns, unquote, for the U.S. shale industry. Uh, then they quote this uh Onyx Point Global Management, that the problem facing fracking companies is that they can't access cheap capital any longer. Without new infusions of money, the industry can't drill for more oil, and that is why the Saudis feel confident taunting the U.S. oil industry. 
the prince's confidence is based in the financial realities of U.S. shale, which is true. This, these things never made money for the most part. They didn't even positive cash flow. There's no interest in financing another shale boom. It's over. Um, and so what I think is going to happen, you combine this with the current zeitgeist in this administration or view towards fossil fuels, where they are trying to do anything they can to hinder the supply of more fossil fuels. You have, as I reported last week, Janet Yellen, who's the Treasury Secretary, and has big influence with these World Bank and IMF. They're going to, in all these other little agencies that supply funding, you know, around the world to not make any more fossil fuel investments. And so every bit of your energy that you rely on, you're going to see constricted over time for lack of funding. And that's bullish long term. And uh, I think that we are heading for, as I said before, an energy crisis. I believe OPEC stature will increase over time as we shift, uh, if we don't develop resources here, uh, or if we strangle and make it as difficult as we can around the world to strangle uh, fossil fuel development, whether it's coal, natural gas, or oil, which is happening. And, uh, you know, it's just a self-immolation, the continued decline of the West, the self-loathing and hate of the West that it seems to have that wants to self-destruct itself, that we have this collective desire to kill ourselves over some, I don't know why. I think maybe it's that whole situation of strong men create good times, good times create soft men, and soft men create crisis. It's just that never-ending cycle, I believe. And that's what we're in. We're, we have very weak, feckless men nowadays. I'm not one of them. I don't think a lot of you are either that listen to this. And they're in power. And, um, you know, they're soft and weak. And uh, they want to apologize for success. They want to apologize for the civilization that we've created in the West. They want to spit on the graves of all of our ancestors that created what we have today. And uh, I'm not one of those people. And um, we'll just have to, we're, we're just along for the ride. We're in the back of the, back of the car. with our, We don't have our hands on the wheel. So that was a little bit of a, distraction, but expect higher energy prices, expect an energy crisis in the next couple of years, in my view. What does an energy crisis mean? I don't know. Exceeding the previous highs in the oil price is $200 a barrel for oil possible. Anything's possible. You know, how will you feel about the green revolution? How will you feel about the Democratic Party if you're paying $7 a gallon for gasoline? What if you have to sit in a gas line? I mean, I did that as a kid. I was around when we had the last energy crisis. I was a little kid, but I, re I don't remember it vividly, but I remember it. I remember sitting in gas lines. You had to sit there for hours and they rationed the gas. Kind of very Soviet-esque, standing in queues for limited supplies of goods. You see, people take a lot of things for granted. Soft people take things for granted. They don't understand how we got where we are how we attain the things that we attain, how the supply chains work, how hard men have to go into the earth and extract minerals so that our civilization can continue. It's just all taken for granted. Well, the Saudis know what's going to happen and they're just sitting there rubbing their hands together in glee. So this is an interesting development that a lot of people are not paying attention to. Natural gas prices are now on the forward part of the curve going out to the winter above $4 an MCF. Uh, we're seeing the same thing now in natural gas as we've seen in oil and coal and other energy forms. It's going up in price because the ability to just, rant, just have capital thrown at this business is being constricted. And so the ramifications are higher prices. And what's interesting about this is it's not only good for gas producers. I mean, I, you, know, you look at a company like Sandridge that is uh, unhedged, uh, I've mentioned it before. You look at a company like Antero Resources that has some hedges, I think, that are coming off. I, don't, I, I need to look at their hedge book. But this is positive for gas producers. They're not running out and going nuts drilling either. And so, uh, you know, as the economy recovers around the world, or at least this reflation continues, if you, whether you want to call it, you know, it's still the statistics are going up. Let's put it that way, whether that's because of the money printing, whatever it's happening. We're going to see this and this, you know, it wasn't too long ago, folks. I remember maybe 
in the early aughts, 2002, two, three, something like that, before the fracking boom that really started in natural gas, that we thought we were going to be, we were importing natural gas. We thought we were going to be a net importer of natural gas, and then the fracking situation unlocked the vast treasure trove of natural gas, which basically crashed prices for a decade. But there were times where in the wintertime, if we didn't fill our storage properly and we had cold winters, that we would see gas spike to 10 or 12 or $14 in MCF. And I suspect that that's going to happen again. And the, the, the unanticipated consequences of our choices are going to be, start becoming uh, very relevant to people's lives. Uh, we've had a 10 year basically of, you know, nothing really bad happening. And we're going to see that changing, I think, going forward. And higher energy prices is one manifestation of that. Now, why is this good for coal? Well, it's good for coal because there still are many power plants in the world and in the U.S. that are dual fuel. They can burn natural gas and coal or coal. And you say, how can that happen, John? Uh, coal is not like gas. How do they do that? Well, if you most modern, uh, if you look at, you know, some old movie where the guys are shoveling coal into a boiler, that's not really how coal is burned. There are some smaller boilers that have uh, traveling grates where they drop the coal on there and the travel great, the grate travels, it burns slowly. That's not how most things are done. Basically, you take the coal, uh, chunks of coal, pieces of coal, and you run them through a pulverizer in the power plant and it creates a dust. You're reducing it to like a dust. And then you just change out what they call the guns and the burners between if you want to burn gas or fuel oil or, or pulverized coal. And so if you have the ability to fuel shift based on pricing, you're starting, I don't know the exact ratio. It's out there. I should have went out and found the data. I'll probably take a look at it today. But if natural gas prices go up by X, you'll see this much fuel switching to coal. And uh, that's why you're seeing actually coal volumes in, from the, Powder River Basin are starting to increase now because the demand for people that can switch are switching because everything is economics. You know, that's what things run on. And if uh, you're able to burn coal and the price is cheaper than gas, then that's what you're going to do. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's things that people don't think about, but that's uh, beneficial for coal also. Maybe even more so than it would be for gas. I'm, I'm talking about rising gas prices. So I want to talk about this, you know, the media, the media is not there to be an investigative force and try to like get to the truth. The media sells advertising. It's advertising supported. It needs eyeballs. It needs to attract attention. And so you've heard the old media adage or the adage of journalists, if it bleeds, it leads crisis, you, you know, salacious uh, activities of famous people, um, end of the world scenarios, what, what have you. This is what people like to read. This is what attracts eyeballs and then consequently attracts advertising. And so we go back to September 24th, 1976, New York Times talking about that the we need to, we need a realization that we've got about 35 years worth of oil left in the whole world. We're going to run out of oil. That was in 1976, September 24th, the New York Times. It's now 2011 would have been 35 years. We did not run out of oil. As a matter of fact, we were in the middle of the shale boom. We had more oil than, than we ever thought we would have. And so I continue to say that I'm over time, I'm going to point post these vignettes when I come up of these, these type of things when I come about them, because the media, nobody tracks this stuff. Nobody really pays attention to this. You just read it or you see it and you don't give it any thought. It just fades into the memory. But these people are typically never right about anything ever. The rising of the sea levels, the melting of the ice caps, none of this stuff is happening. There's no retraction. There's no consequences. There's no realization among people that the people that are they have you know the media is the, the the press if you will i think originally i'm talking like back in the you know you watch those old movies from the 30s with the guy walking around with the everybody wore hats back then he had a little card sticking in his hat said press and they were chasing the politicians around 
with a little notebook uh, asking them, you know, hard questions. That's not really what happens. Um, if you ask the hard questions, you won't get any access to anybody. That's how it works. You're supposed to ask canned questions. You're supposed to get on board. You won't be invited to the parties. You'll be ostracized. Therefore, there's no really investigative journal, journals, journalism. I mean, you see independent media like myself and other people, but we're, we're criticized because we're, you know, we don't do fact checking, but you do see some people out there that are kind of semi-famous that do good journalism, like Cheryl Atkinson. She kind of does her own thing. She used to be a big media person, uh, I think at CBS, and she got fired. And she's out there. There's other people, Greg Hunter. There's people doing, you know, good investigative journalism, but it's hard to do. Um, and, you know, nobody's asking the questions. And these people have tremendous power in our society that we allow them to have. And they're just now state organs. It's state propaganda. It's agate prop, agitation propaganda meant to shape a view so that the, you know, basically, as Eisenhower said, the military industrial complex, the big deep state can continue to rock and roll. And that's what I believe. You know, here's another one. These people have been liars from the beginning. They lie constantly. Lie. They're liars like their father, the devil, who was a liar from the beginning. That's why I'm saying there's evil in the world. And it's detrimental to people. So here we have an CNN which is piped into every airport. It's all over the place in public venues. I never, I never watch CNN ever. I don't watch TV. I don't have cable. I don't watch cable news. I don't know what they say. I just see these vignettes and I put them up. So this Elizabeth Cohen back in April 11th, 2020, had a headline with a Dr. Nagam at CNN. President Trump is wrong in so many ways about hydroxychloroquine st studies, hydroxychloroquine studies. Here are the facts. And then I don't know the context of the article, but then in July of 2020, basically three or four months later, study finds hydroxychloroquine helped coronavirus patients survive better. So... Like I said, I don't, I'm just going by the headlines. I don't know the context of the articles, but what I'm trying to tell you is, you know, these media companies, like the president was advocating about hydroxychloroquine and, you know, a lot of people politicized it. It doesn't matter if Trump said it. It didn't matter if the devil himself said it. What matters is, is hydroxychloroquine a drug that we can use to help people that had COVID. If we're in such a crisis, if so many people are dying, if it's the end of the world and we've got to do everything we can to save people and every life matters, why wouldn't every possible venue or medication taken under consideration? I mean, they mobilized the industrial base of General Motors and other corporations to create ventilators, which they put people on, which subsequent to that, were found out to be causing the deaths, causing more deaths, causing more harm. You see what I'm saying? And so it doesn't matter who said what. It matters is what are the facts? Are the facts that this helps people even marginally? Then it should be used. But the problem is, again, here comes the, you know, John's a conspiracy theorist. If you have viable treatments for a, for a, disease, if you will, which several prominent physicians were treating people with hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, if it's shown that, it, 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 that it's effective and it needs to be studied, but if it's shown to be effective, then you cannot get approval for a COVID-19 vaccine. You cannot get approval if you already have drugs that can, you know, You'd have to go through the whole process of showing it have it more efficacy than the existing drugs. It's, it makes it difficult. And then you can't have the emergency use authorization. Then you can't have the billions of dollars in revenue. Then you can't have the five executives at Moderna becoming billionaires in the last 18 months. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason they were approved, but I'm just telling you that's, what, that's how these things work. And so the media doesn't look into this. The media doesn't investigate it. They don't try to put two and two together. And they constantly contradict themselves. So should they be taken at face value? Or should you question every single thing that you read?
or here? That's what my suggestion is. So this is interesting. We talked about China earlier. This is a chart showing that 2020 or 20, 2000, this is the countries which share greater trade with either the United States or China. And you can see in 2000, most of the countries around the world had more trade with the United States than they did China. That was in 2000. 20 years later, most of the countries in the world have more trade with China than they do the United States. So who's going to, who's, who's going to be the world leader? Who's going to be the new hegemon? Look at Africa. It's completely infested. Every country in Africa and most of the countries in Asia have more trade with China than the U.S. And U.S. is going to maintain and be the global hegemon? I mean, I don't see it, guys. Here's the data. I mean, this is one data point. Now, China has problems just like every other country, but I don't see this being positive for the United States and its desire to, you know, be the world power. So this is kind of encouraging. There are encouragements occasionally that come along. EU climate plan dead on arrival as Hungary says it will veto. European Union rolled out an ambitious climate plan to transform every corner of its economy on Wednesday and braced for years of tough negotiations to turn it into reality. In Hungary, Prime Minister Viktor Orban's government already embroiled in a standoff with Brussels over LG, an LGBTQ crackdown. You see, this is the media again. This is, an, this is an article, this is a discussion about the EU climate plan being DOA, okay? Because any member can veto it and then it stops in its tracks, okay? And so what they do is they want to skew your view. We don't want to concentrate on this issue. The crackdown by the government of Hungary on an LGBTQT crackdown or whatever they're talking about, that's a separate subject. It, it has nuances. It has different facts. So what they're trying to do here is they're trying to create a, they're trying to create a uh, narrative in your mind. And the narrative is that um, the government in Hungary is right wing um, and has crackdowns on LGBTQ people so they be bad. Hungary government bad because don't like gay people. So must be bad on climate. You see, the two things are separate issues. They should be looked at separately because there's no context here. It's just one little sentence put in there to skew your view towards Hungary. Now, I don't have, you know, it's the government of Hungary is a reflection of the Hungarian people. That's who elected them. Okay. So the, the, the people in Eastern Europe, for the most part, in a lot of these places, okay, are, are nationalistic. That's just how they are. And uh, they have become members of the EU because it was beneficial to them. And so they're not going to be, you know, to be part of the EU, you have to get on board with all their policies. And this is where the conflict is coming from. And this is where the, I think the eventual breakup of the EU happens. Because uh, as the people in Brussels are going to find out is that people in Eastern Europe don't necessarily share their views on some of these issues because they're not beneficial to them. So the government in Hungary flatly rejected the plan saying it threatened to undo its signature utility price cuts. Cabinet Minister Goliath told reporters in Budapest on Thursday, quote, this would also destroy the results of utility price cuts. Therefore, this proposal is unacceptable for Hungary in its current shape. And since unanimity is required, the EU can't implement this proposal. So, of course, what will happen is the demonization, the press will get activated. They'll talk about all the other issues that have nothing to do about how Hungary government bad, EU good, Hungary government homophobe, EU government pro-homo, EU, uh, Hungary government doesn't want to give the program, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But what's the real reason? The utility price cuts, energy costs going down in Hungary, because if you institute all these proposals that the EU and these green people are talking about, the price of energy has to go up and will go up. And that's not pal palatable to the people of Hungary. And therefore, the government of Hungary is going to have some trepidation about going along with this. And that's going to cause the conflicts. That's going to cause the, you know, we get into a situation where you have $200 oil 
no one is going to be for green energy anymore. You can forget about it. Now, I think that's the bet with a lot of these large companies like BlackRock that are becoming activists now. The government in the United States, for example, I don't believe is going to be able to pass a lot of the legislation. You can't get some of this stuff through. It's just not going to fly with most people. It does fly in your large cities in the north and in the coasts, but the majority of people aren't on board with this stuff. And so the corporations, they're going to use the corporations to get this stuff done. And I fully suspect that a company like BlackRock that has trillions of dollars under management that you know, was very helpful in the Exxon uh, situation where they challenged them on climate change with that small hedge fund and got board seat board seats replaced. You know, why not? What's I think the gamble or the bet is if we can get energy prices up high, then everybody will be more amicable to having the green transition because we can sell it as lowering energy costs. That's what I believe is the is the plan. Um, I don't know, but uh, regardless, I think, you know, it goes back to heads we win, tails we win more, regardless of which scenario ends up being the correct scenario. But I think that, uh, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men, the everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. The, you know, I'm a military historian, there's so many battle plans that have been put together. And then, you know, within a day or two of the, of the major offensive starting, the whole thing goes askew. You can plan and game things out, but you can't control reality. You can't control what actually happens in most, in a lot of cases. And you know the story about for lack of a, um, about how the king lost his kingdom for lack of a shoed horse. Uh, I don't know exactly how the poem goes, but you can look it up. One little thing can throw the whole plan out of whack. So I wanted to show this because, you know, I've said for many many years that one of the primary drivers or I, I feel is one of the main drivers of a higher gold price is negative real interest rates. And you can see that back in the 70s, when we had the gold price really take off, you know, when it really went to, uh, you know, over $800 an ounce, which at that time was the highest price ever, you had, you know, real interest rates approaching negative 5%. And look at this, we're, 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 we're there, we're there and you know the gold price is struggling it's at 1800 gold miners are making a ton of money although input costs are probably rising now because of um the uh, inflationary impulse but we're not seeing that big push gold has been off the radar screen it's the sediment is horrible gold stocks are are like some of the worst performing stocks this year but i think that's going to change and i think that this uh if we continue with ne these negative real interest rates, you know, if you're holding a bond, you know, you're losing money, you're losing purchasing power, and you don't get that back. I mean, if you're holding a treasury bill, or if you're holding, you know, a bond that's paying you one and a half percent, you're losing three and a half percent of purchasing power, and you, you lose that forever. That's why they used to call bonds in the 70s, certificates of confiscation. And so as that realization sets in, I think there's going to be more and more desire to shift to these other asset classes, i.e. gold, i.e. hard assets, uh, as a way to protect against the deprivations of the government and central bank. The other thing I wanted to point out is how high can interest rates really go? You can't, you know, this is, you know, when we had these tremendous inflation and negative re real rates back in the 70s, we had Paul Volcker come in and raise rates to, I don't know, what, however high you raise them, 20, I have to go back and look, 15, 20% and crushed inflation, but he also crushed the economy. And um, it had to be done to squeeze the inflation out of the, out of the um, you could see what happened to real rates during the 80s. They went, you know, massively positive. This was an excellent performance for bonds over this period. And uh, interest rates eventually came down massively. And then uh, you, it was just tremendous return for bonds in these, these two decades. So I think that's changed. And you really see we've really experienced negative rates for a long period of time now. So that's another, you know, these numbers here, 31%, that was the U.S. government debt to GDP was only 31% when Volcker did that. And so it didn't crush the U.S. government's finances. Now the U.S. government debt to GDP is 128%. You can't raise rates. What can the Fed do? I mean, they jawboned, uh, 
you know, back in June, and that really took the steam and the mustard out of the uh, resource stock bull market that we were in. Um, it was a big sell-off. And what really happened, though? No rates were raised. They moved a couple of uh, dots around on their dot plot and said, well, we might consider moving up the, you know, tapering. You know, I mean, it was all nonsense. It doesn't, there was no action. So what can they do? They can't raise rates to even 2% or 3%. It would crash the economy. And so I think eventually this realization sets in and then you see the shift in asset classes because who's going to sit around for a couple of decades with a 10 year or 30 year bond uh, and, you know, constantly lose money. But that's one of the ways that a government can get itself out of debt. It can do this financial repression where it holds real rates negative for a long period of time. And that basically just steals wealth from the population. And, you know, the government is the umpire. It can make the rules. It can force banks to hold treasury securities. It can force pension funds and insurance companies uh, to hold these things and call them risk-free. They've done this before. They will do it again. And I think that that leads to uh, a shift where people can to hard assets. So this is another uh, situation where I think you can be positive about gold stocks. Uh, you know, I'm a fan of the CAPE ratio. It's a cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio for telling, uh, for looking to see when markets are overvalued or undervalued relative. That it's not a good timing tool because markets can stay in periods of overvaluation or undervaluation for long periods of time. But you know that I like to sell overvaluation and buy undervaluation. And what we see is if you go back to 1929, the CAPE was at, at that point relatively high 30 when we had the correction in the stock market, well, the crash, if you will, and then the subsequent fall of the Cape all the way down to like seven. But you will notice that gold stocks performed brilliantly during the same period. And that was a period of deflation, by the way. And so you had a similar situation here in 1965 where the Cape got to a relatively high, at least for these, this period of economic history, 22, 23. And uh, it's, again, subsequently con contracted. And what gold do? Gold did fairly well during, gold stocks did well during this time. And it was the same thing in 2000. We get to these very high extremes is what I'm trying to point out to you. High extremes in the cyc cyclically adjusted PE ratio. Gold stocks take it on the chin. The, the financial assets are at all time highs. And then we see a shift. The market, of course, that was the tech wreck in 2000, and gold stocks performed magnificently relative to the S&P. And now we're in a similar situation where gold stocks now have underperformed relative to the S&P over the last five years or so, uh, over the last 11 years, if you will. And now we're getting to very high levels in the Cape again. Uh, you know, we're at 38 on the Cape. We could go higher. We haven't exceeded the old... Um, high in 2000, but we're getting into areas where we're getting to an extreme. And so I would suggest to you that uh, with gold stocks being out of favor, the, their actual businesses are doing quite well. They've shown, I think, record amount of quarters in a row of positive cash flow. And so I would suggest to you that uh, eventually when this market rolls over, which it will, I think you could see a period of outperformance by the gold stocks. That's what I'm trying to point out. And so last but not least, uh, you can go check this out. Uh, I'll put a link to this in the show notes. But there was a, a Sprott Gold Talk Radio Opportunities in Uranium. They had the guys on that uh, basically are running the Sprott Uranium Trust. They talk about basic fundamentals around the uranium market, but they also give some insight into the trust and how they're going to run it and what's going on with that. So uh, you... People, I think, are jazzed up about the Sprott um, Uranium Trust being a catalyst. I think it's not going to be an immediate catalyst, but I think it's going to create constant amount of buying, the ability for people to, and institutional players to put money into the uranium market. And this will, you know, the with the Sprott Trust having the at-the-market function, that when the trust sells at a, po as, at a positive uh, to its... Um, net asset value, they can issue shares and buy more physical uranium. So I think it could act as a catalyst for a constant amount of buying pressure in a very, very small and opaque market. 
Okay, guys, that's it for this week. Uh, like I said, uh, we're missing some of the links that I normally put up, but I appreciate the patronage. I appreciate my subscribers. You guys have been great. Uh, the video channel continues to grow on YouTube, the podcast channel. That was a great suggestion that guys wanted it. So we provided it. It's been growing. I hope you're enjoying it. It's not as visual, I know, but I try to uh, be as detailed as I can. People seem to be getting value from all of this. And I look forward to interacting with you in the comments. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, I'll continue to do this show. It continues to grow. I'm grateful for the, for the people that uh, give it a listen. And, uh, you know, we'll just keep doing it as long as we can and trying to get to the truth any way we can. So that's it for this week, guys. Talk to you next week. Have a good weekend.